There was a Time article years ago that said butter is back. What was the article's authors saying, and was it true? There have been many articles claiming that butter is back in the New York Times, the cover of Time magazine, and all of that is predicated on this pop culture narrative about saturated fat having been exonerated. Saturated fat was never exonerated. We've just discussed that. And even if there were doubts about saturated fat per se, there have been almost no studies to show that there are any remote health benefits of butter. Where there is some debate about saturated fat is atypical saturated fatty acids that show up in some fermented dairy products. So that there's interest in some of the unusual short and medium chain saturated fatty acids in some cheeses, in some yogurts. Uh, and so butter is back is really just a, a, a cheeky expression. Uh, it makes for a nice clickbait, for example. So it, if you want to start talking about evidence related to saturated fat in a way that's sure to attract eyeballs, you say butter is back. Th there are almost too many important provisos to this to enumerate them all. But let's be clear about the fact that even those saturated fats and even those sources of saturated fat where there's some debate, and that, that is true, for example, of stearic acid, which is a saturated fat in dark chocolate. It's true of lauric acid, which is a saturated fat in coconut. Uh, and it may be true of some of the saturated fats in fermented dairy products. Across that expanse, the very best, most hopeful, most positive evidence suggests that maybe they're not harmful. But that's it. There's no evidence anywhere in the mix to suggest that if you eat any of these things instead of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, or seeds, that you derive an actual benefit. Well, I'm tempted to wonder, when did maybe not overtly harmful become the bar we want to clear with what's good to eat? I don't really understand how that happened. So butter is not back. Tell us about the study of 100,000 people over 30 years that showed the higher the intake of protein from animal sources, the higher the rate of premature death from all causes, and the higher the percent of protein calories from plant sources like beans and lentils in particular, the lower the rate of premature death from all causes. <laughs> My recollection is this study is by Song et al., but again, it's, it's, a, it's a large group of researchers at Harvard who are harnessing the power of these large cohorts that they've followed for decades. <clears throat> and it, it really is a matter of asking the right question and conducting the right analysis. So they had the opportunity to look at from altitude, the percent of calories from different types of fat and different foods, and the percent of calories for different sources of protein. And the conclusions are really quite stark. If you get a lot of your fat calories from meat and dairy, rates of all chronic disease and premature death are significantly elevated as compared to getting your fat calories, even if the total fat intake is the same, from plant sources. And exactly the same conclusion about protein. If you get lots of protein calories from animal sources, meat and dairy, rates of chronic disease and premature death are high. Even if you eat the same amount of total protein but you get it from plants, rates of chronic disease and premature death are low. And this is really a very large and important data set. We're talking about 30 million person years of observation or, or some such thing, uh, or 3 million, rather. And uh, although you have to worry with large cohort studies about asking too many questions and you know, potentially um, data dredging, I, I think these studies are especially valuable for the kinds of studies that look from altitude, ask these big questions. So we look at major shifts in the overall dietary pattern and how those track with the outcomes that matter most. How long do people live and how well? So I think these are really significant findings.
And it's also important that these findings are directionally consistent with lots of randomized control trials, with lots of basic science and mechanistic studies as well. Ultimately, that's a critical consideration too. What we know most reliably, we know not just from one kind of evidence, but from the alignment and confluence of many different kinds of evidence. So if we've got mechanistic studies to tell us how it is that animal protein and, and saturated fat can contribute to inflammation and atherosclerosis and chronic disease, okay, that makes it more likely that they would. If we then have randomized trials in the short term that show if you eat more saturated fat, more animal protein, your inflammatory markers go up, your endothelial function is compromised, your blood pressure is elevated, your blood glucose or insulin may be elevated, your lipids are perturbed. Okay, well, we now see effects in the short term that would likely mean more disease and death in the long term. And then you do these kinds of large, long cohort studies that Harvard runs, and they produce the same conclusion. Yeah, actually, that's what we're seeing in a population, higher intakes of animal protein, saturated fat, higher rates of heart disease, other chronic disease, and premature death. Put all of that together it's very conclusive.